Good afternoon everyone, my name is Dion de Aachen. Here is my face, but I'm going to take it away so you all don't get distracted. Um, and today I'll be telling you about a project that was started by Ian Rushworth um, from his Invedo KZN Wildlife just after the lockdown started in about April 2020 uh, about developing guidelines for the genetic management of Southern African vertebrates. Since then, uh, we have assembled a core team where the co-authors listed, representing two Southern African countries, South Africa and Namibia, um, and various conservation agencies and two universities. Uh, we've done three funding applications, one of which was unsuccessful and two are currently pending, and we've developed example guidelines for three species. So first of all, why is genetics important in conservation? Well, genetic variation is the cornerstone of evolution um, as it provides a substrate for natural selection to act upon. So natural selection here is represented by Drake, um, clearly preferring this variant to the other one. Um, and thus natural selection enables species to adapt to changing environmental conditions, uh, novel diseases, and so forth. Genetic diversity uh, within species, not only between species, is important in ecosystem function and ecological processes. Um, and genetic differentiation or structure between populations um, eventually may lead to speciation, which then creates species diversity. <clears throat> the Convention on Biological Diversity um, classifies genetic diversity as one of three crucial components of biodiversity, uh, with the other two being species diversity and ecosystem diversity. But genetic diversity worldwide um, of species is decreasing uh, as a general trend, and this is predominantly due to habitat degradation and population loss, unsustainable harvesting, invasive species, and increasingly extreme climatic events. Um, despite this, uh, genetic diversity, and in particular genetic diversity within species, is poorly represented in national and international policy and legislation. Um, and I point, for, point you to this excellent paper by Sean Hoban et al. for further reading. So, getting to the guidelines themselves, what are the guidelines going to look like? So, essentially, it's a website with a page for each species. Um, and then on that page, we'll have different sections. So, the main references, the management level, defined predominantly as, as evolutionary significant units and management units because these are terminology or terms already in use uh, by conservation agencies like Isenvelo, KZN Wildlife and Cape Nature, and they have set definitions, um, whereas classifications like subspecies are more subjective. Um, okay, maps will also be included showing management boundaries, um, nicely illustrated, and then of course the actual management guidelines, and then some other topics may or may not be covered depending on the species. So why is, do we think these guidelines are necessary? Well, first of all, to make conservation genetics and phylogeographic studies and literature accessible um, to conservation practitioners and private owners of wildlife that um, you know, can really benefit from these studies in managing their wildlife populations. Um, at the moment, it might not be accessible because the, the literature is behind a paywall or um, you know, due to scientific jargon getting in the way of, of actually understanding what what the research shows and what should be done about it. Um, thus, we hope these guidelines will aid in translocation and, re and reintroduction decisions by identifying um, the most appropriate source populations of animals for movement um, and thus conserve um, evolutionary processes and prevent inbreeding within species. Um, we then hope to promote transparent evidence-based decision making for permit applications uh, within conservation agencies <clears throat> that need to issue these permits <clears throat> and then finally we'd like to incorporate genetics and specifically intraspecific genetic diversity into conservation policy so um, we hope these guidelines will show how genetics can be applied in on-the-ground conservation and why interspecific genetic diversity should be protected through um, formal incorporation into conservation legislation. So what is our approach? How are we doing this? So essentially a literature search of each species um, and then extracting from that and translating 
the findings into guidelines okay and we will invite uh, we plan on inviting taxon and regional experts to to help us write these guidelines so that uh, we, we're not going to do it all ourselves um, so an important part is also to produce um, standardized management boundary maps um, for each species that clearly show where the boundaries are and then of course the core team will guideline will curate the guidelines before publication online um, and then for the moment we're focusing on large vertebrates and southern africa uh, because this is where um, guidelines like these are especially per pertinent um, to translocation decisions at the moment so we chose three species for which to develop um, example guidelines the first was sable and that um, was led by Henri van Weyck the second was African Buffalo, led by me, and then the third was Hard to be as led by Paulette Bloomer. Okay, so for Sable, this study, um, the, the guidelines for Sable are basically based on one very recent PhD study by Pedro Vespinto of the University of Porto. And, and um, he essentially sequenced the whole mitochondrial genomes of 212 sable across the entire range of the species, as well as including data from 57 nuclear microsatellite loci of more than 400 samples. Um, so he beautifully identified um, different genetic clusters, um, so ESUs, as we can see here. So each color represents a different ESU, there's one here as well. Um, and they're called the Southern ESU, Zambian, um, Eastern, Angolan, and West Tanzanian ESUs. And then within each evolutionally significant unit, he identified um, management units. So those are represented by the letters here, such as MS, ES, WS, and so forth. Okay, um, and this map also beautifully illustrates management boundaries and also the causes um, that might have led to this differentiation, such as rivers, um, lakes, and, and mountainous terrain. So the actual management guidelines that we then came up with for Sable based on this is that there should be no movement between evolutionally significant units um, based on the degree of differentiation and also the timing. So this differentiation all happened between about 400 and 200,000 years ago. Um, and then also we suggest that management units in the southern ESU be managed separately until more samples can be collected um, especially from the southern part of the southern ESU. Um, and then captive bred animals must be genetically tested, so those on in zoos or on private ranches, before they are released into um, natural populations, if they are to release, in order to prevent inadvertent mixing of evolution significant units. <clears throat> and then we might also identify threats, so for example, hybridization between evolution significant units that um, affect the integrity of the genetic diversity or identity within each species, and then um, also hybridization with, with closely related species such as Rona antelope in this example. Moving on to buffalo, um, so there are four recognized subspecies of African buffalo, but based on genetic data, um, these can be divided into two evolutionally significant units. So the southeastern ESU, um, composing of Cape buffalo and then a west central ESU composing essentially of forest buffalo and and some intermediate phenotype by the two subspecies and then within the ESU um, the southeastern ESU there's some isolation by distance so genetic differentiation just because of um, large distances between them and not necessarily physical <clears throat> looking more closely at southern Africa and then at the actual guidelines so in southern Africa uh, so in the southeast um, ESU or Cape Buffalo, there's essentially five management units represented by the different colors here, and an East African unit not shown as it's off map. And the guidelines we came up with is essentially no movement between evolution significant units, and then no movement between management units within the Cape um, ESU, unless, for example, there's inbreeding present in one of the populations, such as Addo, um, in which case we would recommend genetic supplementation with um, a, a management unit within the same evolutionary significant unit.
And then, for example, some populations like Waterberg, Plateau National Park in Namibia, and private ranches may be mixes of management units um, already, as they were um, sort of uh, artificially established. Um, and these should be managed separately as sort of a meta population. Um, and if any of those are to be released into captive, into natural populations, they should be tested beforehand. <clears throat> um, and then, so previous translocations may have already led to some mixing. And actually, Addo Makala and private ranches are disease-free buffalo and represent an insurance policy against disease outbreaks that may, um, you know, sort of obliterate natural populations in future. <clears throat> Finally, moving on to Hartebeest. So for some reason, this map here doesn't show the distribution in South Africa. Um, so I've put this inset here, which shows the distribution in current distribution in red. <clears throat> so there used to be, I think, eight subspecies of Hartebeest. Um, but after this genetic study, um, it found that there were essentially two evolutionally significant units, a northern unit and a southern unit. Um, that split about 500,000 years ago. And the southern unit consists of two management units um, that diverged approximately 200,000 years ago. And these are essentially Karma over here and in South Africa and Liechtensteini um, in the bit more northern parts of Southern Africa. <clears throat> and then East Africa has five, three to four uh, management units within, southern, uh, within the northern ESU. Um, Okay, so then uh, the management guidelines for Artebius would essentially be no movement between ESUs um, and then also no mixing of management units, so Karma and Liechtenstein within the southern ESU uh, because those all have diverged quite a long time ago, um, 200,000 years. Um, but the limitations with these guidelines uh, and the available research is basically that we can only give some core scale recommendations um, especially in Southern Africa due to limited sampling in the region. Um, so, so really what you want then is, is the priority research to focus on sampling in Southern Africa, so South Africa, uh, Namibia, especially Kruger as well, um, and Botswana and so forth to determine whether there is genetic structure within the Karma um, management unit in, in Southern Africa and where there might be contact between Karma and Liechtensteini. So finally, what we want to then achieve um, with these guidelines or what the outputs and outcomes will be is a genetic management guidelines for as many uh, vertebrate species as possible um, and the identification of critical sampling gaps within species, um, identifying species that lack any genetic data and then priori prioritizing the species for which to generate these data and for which to generate guidelines. Um, as I mentioned, we want to incorporate these um, guidelines or at least some sort of interspecific genetic diversity into um, conservation legislation. And this project also contributes to um, an ongoing project of the IUCN Conservation Genetic Specialist Group Africa section um, uh, in a project where they're cataloging the genetic diversity of species in Africa, all species in Africa. And then ultimately through the implementation of these guidelines, um, we hope to enable species to maintain their adaptive capacity and evolutionary resilience even after we're gone. Thank you for your attention.